Good morning. Um, how many of you have tried integrating React Native into an existing app? Yeah, quite a few. OK. So this is what we usually call brownfield, so adding React Native into an existing native app. And at TOS, we were integrating React Native into our existing app with around 20 million monthly active users and hundreds of developers. And by the end of this talk, you will know the key challenges and solutions that worked for us at scale. So what do we mean by scale? Uh, here's what we are dealing with at TOS. So we're deploying over 40 times daily uh, with around more than 100 microservices with bundle sizes uh, as low as 200 kilobytes, which loads in less than a second and builds in under 10 seconds. Well, this was not that easy to get here, and we faced uh, plenty of challenges along the way. But uh, I'll share why we needed these capabilities and what obstacles we hit and uh, the solutions that actually worked for us. And I'll show you some examples of how it performs in production. Um, I'm Sajin Park and head of, head of front end engineering at TOS, uh, managing around 100 front end developers. And feel free to connect with me on GitHub. My handle is uh, here. And now let me explain why uh, we needed Brownfield React Native at scale. Well, let me start by explaining uh, what, why we needed Brownfield React Native at this scale. And TOS is Korea's a leading financial super app. So we handle money transfers, investing, payments, asset management, like everything finance related. So when someone wants to send money to their friends, they just simply use our app uh, to send money. And uh, on top of that, like, we provide a lot of services. So around half of all Koreans rely on our app for their, uh, most of their financial needs. So with this massive scale and complexity, like, we faced unique challenges. Like, as a super app, we operate uh, hundreds of different uh, financial services, like each with different teams and different timelines and technical requirements. And some services were built natively, and others used web views, and we needed to add React Native into this mix. So coordinating development across all these technologies at scale became our biggest challenge. Now, uh, integrating React Native into native apps uh, basically is, isn't inherently that difficult. You just define a React Native view, like connect it into an activity or a view controller and just load a JavaScript bundle. So it's basically simple. But uh, the real problem emerges at scale. So traditional React Native puts all the services and screens into one giant bundle. So I'll call it a monolithic bundle. And uh, when we develop with a monolithic bundle, many of you have probably see this every day, uh, Metro trying to start a dev server. So for our monolithic build, like even if we had like only tens of services, uh, the dev server startup took around like 30 or 40 seconds, and production builds were like, t it, take, it took like two or five minutes. And like when you're deploying 40 or more times daily, uh, this was a big burden for us. And uh, on top of that, our single bundle was around five megabytes, and loading that big bundle on a low-end Android device took significant time, uh, which lead, led to like frustrated users at loading screens. And with everything in one bundle, we faced an all-or-nothing deployment scenario. That is, uh, one bug in any service meant like either rolling back the entire app or letting users suffer through those errors. So um, the straightforward solution would be that oh, let's split these bundles into like smaller and standalone bundles. So this might make sense. But uh, for us, simply splitting the bundles was not, was not enough. Um, each bundle still included like React and React Native and native modules. Like resulting in like more than three megabytes per service. So uh, when we try to include like hundreds of microservices into one app, like we are looking at 300 or more megabytes of app sizes, which was not practical. 
so to eliminate code duplication, uh, we s split each standalone bundles into two parts. So the first bundle is called the shared bundle, which contains core libraries like React, React Native, and native modules that all the services use. And the service bundle contains only the specific code for each individual service. And this way, uh, instead of every service carrying its own copy of React and React Native, uh, they share one common bundle uh, while keeping their unique logic separate. So basically, here's how it works. Uh, the shared bundle defines a special require function in the global namespace. And when you write uh, some import statements like import React from React in a service bundle, then our bundler transforms it into a call to that special require function. So in Metro, this is just a resolver, resolver configuration change. Uh, when building service bundles, we just check the module name and redirect, re redirect some shared library imports to our global require function. So at runtime, uh, you first load the shared bundle and then load the service bundle using uh, React Native, some uh, native API like in queue application script or load script from file uh, for each OS. And, and we could get the re immediate results that uh, service bundle's size were really, uh, it dropped to around like a less than one megabyte from like three or more megabytes each. And build times were uh, improved for us uh, that because like less code meant faster processing. And developer experience in was enhanced with quicker dev server startup. So instead of bundling everything repeatedly, like each service has uh, now only handled its specific code. And for users, uh, just-in-time loading dramatically improved our initial experience because instead of loading all services up front, uh, we only, load, only loaded what the users actually needed uh, to see the first screen. And uh, stability was got also a, got a major boost through in independent deployments because instead of one service breaking the entire app, we could now isolate and roll back problematic services while keeping everything else running smoothly. So in short, uh, we achieved a good developer experience because smaller apps man meant faster builds and better performance because uh, loading, we loaded some screens just in time as the user actually uses that screen and enhanced stability because independent deployments. But um, we weren't, uh, this was great, but we weren't satisfied yet. Um, uh, we tried, we needed something better and greater. Um, even with bundle splitting, as mentioned before, uh, we uh, had some more problems. Uh, the first was uh, developer experience issues. That is, uh, even after splitting the bundles, uh, for us, uh, build times were still over 90 seconds for large services. Well, that might be short, but uh, we needed uh, much for faster builds. And sometimes uh, we always try to uh, use the reset cache option because of the inconsistent build uh, of Metro. And after inspecting the service bundles, uh, what the Metro built, uh, we found out that uh, there might be some ex problems in the user experience because uh, Metro didn't have tree shaking. That meant that uh, around like six in one service bundle, 66% uh, of unused code was in our service bundle. And uh, from our experiment, uh, here are some figures. So bundle size directly impacted our initial loading experience. Like for example, we found out that if the JavaScript bundle is around four megabytes, like it took like around three seconds loading on low-end Android phones. But if we reduce that size into like a megabyte, then uh, the loading time was reduced to around 0.8 seconds. 
Um, and since we are a brownfield app, uh, React Native's views were created on demand, so when users actually navigated to them. So this means that uh, initial loading time is really critical for us, and users expect instant transitions on not white loading screens between features. So bundle size wasn't uh, just a nice to have, but it was a critical for our user experience. So we decided to try a transitioning from Metro to a bundler called ESBuild for three reasons. So first, uh, in order to uh, make the build time shorter, uh, we had some experiences that uh, since ESBuild was written in Go with concurrency in mind, uh, the build times would be much better. And since it's very consistent and doesn't make heavy use of a cache, like there were no more cache resets. And also ESBuild um, supports tree shaking out of the box, so it really helps us eliminate unused code dramatically. Um, the migration itself was uh, kind of hard, but uh, it was uh, basically simply uh, moving the metros uh, um, configurations about React Native to ES build. So, for example, uh, for example, it required configuring ES build to handle React Native special syntax, like React Native uses flow or like reanimated use uh, special functions called worklets. And we could make these these we had to transpile these into um, uh, code that ES build can understand. So we could make this happen by configuring loaders. And we also needed to handle React Native's, well, platform-specific file extensions like .ios, .js, or .android, .js. And this was solved by configuring uh, ESBuild's module resolution to recognize and prioritize these platform-specific files. And uh, after uh, using ESBuild for our production builds, we really saw solid improvements because uh, for really small services, uh, build times came down to uh, like under 10 seconds. Uh, and smaller services, building time was around like two seconds. As you can see in this example, I run this like, a week ago. And uh, bundle sizers were like cut in half through these, uh, the tree shaking alone. Uh, with, and on top of that, with additional optimizations, uh, we were able to achieve like bundles around like 200 kilobytes. So service bundles now load at 200 kilobytes, like del delivering the sub-second loading experience our users deserve. So uh, let me summarize what ESBuild delivered for us. So it meant great DX for us, so fast builds under 10 seconds, and great UX for users because dead code elimination enabled tree shaking. And it also helped us stability because uh, instead of uh, using reset cache every time, like uh, it provided consistent build. So uh, let me give you a quick summary of today's talk. So today, to solve the monolithic bundle problem, we try to split the bundles into independent pieces. Uh, uh, in the middle, uh, we needed uh, some model called the two bundle model. And this gave us faster build times and better performance and independent deployments for stability. Um, but Metro wasn't enough for great UX and DX, so we transitioned to ES build, and this gave us builds under 10 seconds, like and sub-second loading and 200 kilobytes bundles. And well. I think recognizing these challenges are universal when integrating React Native into an existing native app. So uh, we, are, uh, we open sourced our entire uh, solution as called a fra framework called Granite. Uh, we are calling it an enterprise-grade React Native framework. So uh, Granite provides everything we discussed uh, before. So from the bundle splitting architecture and optimization from ES build, and also since uh, it, our architecture is kind of different from the traditional React Native infrastructure, we need a new infrastructure for OTA updates. And 
so we try to make Granite uh, as easy as possible. So starting with our framework is easy. Uh, just run MPX cre create Granite app latest to scaffold a new project with the, all the tooling configured. And run the NPM run dev, and you'll get the familiar developer experience you've been used to. And also, uh, building the uh, service bundles is straightforward. Just run NPM run build, and it completes in seconds. And uh, this is a screenshot that I took yesterday, and the results resulting like Hermes bytecode bundle is around like 120 kilobytes, and which is really small. And in order to serve these service bundles, we need a uh, on uh, OTA over the air. So we need a special infrastructure. We also provide uh, infrastructure for these OTA updates that you can host on AWS. So we use Pulumi for infrastructure as code. So you just need to provide your AWS credentials, and the entire infrastructure gets provisioned automatically. So. If you want to try this yourself, like everything we built, uh, we are trying to make it open source. So you can find Granite on GitHub at Toss Granite. Uh, it includes all the bundle splitting, ES build integration, and infrastructure components we discussed today. And if you're interested in, in seeing what else we're working on, feel free to follow, on, follow us on X uh, at Toss FE. Thank you. <laughs>